Welcome to another episode of Agent Provocateur. I'm Alan Walsh with Adam Wild. Our special guest today is the former editor-in-chief of the Hockey News. He's an acclaimed author of the best-selling books, Hockey Dad, Hockey Confidential, and Everyday Hockey Heroes, the most followed media personality in Canada with over 1.5 million followers on Twitter, longtime hockey commentator on TSN and NBC, and the go-to guy for breaking news, especially around trade deadline, the NHL draft, and free agency, also known as, with an alias, Bobby Margarita, with his own (laughs) specialty blended margarita on sale at a store near you. And if it isn't, it should be. Let's welcome the original insider, Bob McKenzie. Well, thank you very much, Alan. Adam, Alan, thank you very much for having me on. It's great to have you here. It's, It's so good to have you. Um, Bob, I've always been fascinated with how people got their start in the hockey industry. So I know that you, you graduated from Ryerson and, uh, and can you tell us where, how you got started, where you went from there? Well, I I went to Ryerson for journalism. All I ever really wanted to be when I was young, you know, like every kid who grows up in Toronto in the 1960s, I wanted to be a Toronto Maple Leaf and play in the National Hockey League. But I think I was, um, I I think I was always really good with objective analysis. And even as a 10 or a 12 year old kid. And so when the Leafs were winning their last cup in 1967, um, I knew I was never going to play in the National Hockey League, even though it would have been, quote unquote, a dream. But when I'd read the Toronto Star, or the Toronto Telegram or the Globe and Mail, and I'd read Red Burnett or Milt Donnell or Jim Proudfoot or Frank Orr or uh, Rex McLeod or Trent Frain or any of the great sports writers, I used to keep a scrapbook. And, and so I was almost as interested in what they did for a living as I was in Terry Sachuk and Johnny Bauer and Tim Horton and Alan Stanley and Dave Keon and the Big M and all, all the, the, the players I idolized growing up. So um, I always had a, an appreciation for that, the printed word. And I also sucked at math and science. And, <laughs> and, and I knew that whatever I was going to do, it would involve either writing or speaking. Um, because I couldn't really do anything else. So um, anyways, long story short, I went to Ryerson. My goal was to be a beat writer for uh, in, in the National Hockey League, to work for the Toronto Star or the Toronto Sun or the, the Toronto Globe and Mail and cover the Leafs. And that was basically all I wanted to do. When I, I, I My first newspaper job was full-time anyways. was uh, I, I had a summer job at the Sioux Star in Sault Ste. Marie in the summer of 1978. That was the summer that Wayne Gretzky left the Sioux and signed with the uh, the WHA. That was also the summer of the Baby Bulls when Johnny Bassett signed six guys to uh, the contracts and Craig Hartsburg played for the Greyhounds then. So I was actually working news that summer, um, but uh, the, the actual Baby Bulls story broke while I was in the sports department for two weeks that summer. So it was exciting for me to, to get to cover hockey stories and that was kind of the, uh, the start of things. And, and then I got hired full-time when I graduated Ryerson and covered the Sioux Greyhounds and... Uh, Really enjoyed that, and then kind of just it was a roller coaster after that. So you you went on to become the editor in chief of the Hockey News, and you were there for many many years. How did you get involved with the Hockey News? Well, I, I was in the Sioux for two years, and I wanted to come back to Southern Ontario. And um, in Sault Ste. Marie, the economy wasn't great at the time. The steel industry was in the tank, you know, Algoma Steel and what have you, and. Uh, My wife couldn't get a job in Sault Ste. Marie. We were pretty far from home, you know, and and we just decided, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to bet on myself. I'm going to go back home to Toronto without a full-time job. So I left the Sioux Star and I, I got a part-time job at the Global Mail. I worked on the rewrite desk two nights, two days a week. Um, I did some freelance writing, junior hockey for the Global Mail. I was doing a lot of freelance writing for the hockey news and a junior hockey magazine on a separate junior hockey magazine. And, and my wife was able to get a really good job at Phillips Electronics in, uh, in Scarborough. So we were, I was doing that and, and grinding away on, on that. And then um, 
while I was doing stuff at the Hockey News, they said to me, hey, uh, would you be interested in being the editor? And I said, well, what do you mean? And they said, the editor-in-chief. And I go, are you crazy? I'm like, eh, I went to 82. I was 25 years old. Wow. And I'd had, wow. Like, I'd had one. And they go, well, you know, you've, you've got a lot of the things we're looking for. Our editor is leaving. Um, we have to hire somebody. And we need somebody who um, obviously knows hockey, but also can edit copy, work on the desk, write headlines, do the production part, which is stuff I did as part of my job at the Sioux star. Um, so, you know, and I said, well, yeah, sure. Of course I would. And, and so we, I went through the interview process and, and uh, they hired me and against all odds. So on June 1st, 1982, um, I took over as editor in chief of the hockey news at the ripe old age of 25. I always remember walking into the offices on King street in Toronto. And I, I, I met, I met everybody. There was only a staff of eight or nine at the time, probably. And I met everybody and I, they said, here's your office. And I'm like, well, okay. And I'm, and I'm, I walk into the office and I close the door and I sit down and I look around and I go, what the hell do I do now? I don't even know, <laughs> I don't even, I don't even know where to start. I was absolutely terrified, but uh, it wasn't long. I was, and I went to Montreal for the draft or Kluzak, Gary Nyland draft. Uh, I remember right. that. And uh, it was on my way. Do you remember that first episode coming out or sorry, first episode, geez, first, um, uh, first release, first hockey news cover, putting all that together. Was, was there some nerves associated? Oh yeah. Big time. So yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure the first issue I did was probably, uh, was, was probably draft related and it probably was a picture of, uh, you know, uh, Gary Nyland and Gord Kluzak and, uh, the, the, the top guys in the draft, if I remember correctly. So I had no idea what I was doing, but I figured it out as I went along. <laughs> and, and back then there really was no breaking news because there was no social media. It was much more profile oriented. Am I right? Well, there was no internet. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Basically. I mean, it, you can't even begin to imagine the, the lack of technology that went along with that job. When I started at the Hockey News, the correspondents who wrote stories for us, they mailed their stories to us. Wow. They mailed them. Hard copy. And we and then we had to have somebody re-input them into a system that would lead to the story. It, it was it's just it's, it's just insane when you really think about it. And you know, so they'd be in the mail. The stories were pretty stale by the time we got them. And then and then they improved that and we got something called a telecopier, which was the forerunner of the fax machine. And it was a big, big boxy thing. And um, you literally would have to type your story out on a, on a piece of paper. And then you would take it and put it in. And there was this drum that rolled around. And it took either four minutes a page or six minutes a page, depending on how much resolution you required. And you would take a phone, the old phone with the, the double end. And there was an acoustic coupler built into this telecopier. And you would dial up the number and there'd be a telecopter at the other end, one machine talking to another machine and you'd plug the phone in and then it would start. And this, a brush would literally go down this drum as it rolled. And it just basically took the contrast between white paper and black type and reproduced it at the other end, like a shadow for all intents and purposes. And, and that's, you know, that was how we got our stories initially. It wasn't that long that I was after that, that we did get computers and, and we started to enter the, the technological age, but you know the internet was uh, was non-existent at least for us at that point. Well, my first year in the business was 1995, and I remember vividly waiting for the hockey news to arrive and going to the back because the hockey news had the box scores, and the box yeah. scores in in not just the NHL but the American League. Yeah. So when you wanted to know how guys were doing and how many points they had, you know, literally that was the resource and you were getting the info a week late. And I vividly recall, you know, calling guys and saying, Hey, you had a pretty good week last week. And I'm getting the information seven days after the fact. You, you, it was probably two weeks late, to be honest. With you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I also remember vividly uh, being on the road from places like Montreal to Ottawa, Montreal to Toronto in a car, 
and stopping off at a gas station and going to a payphone in the winter in a, in a, in a booth that's outside, you know, minus 15 and calling my office and getting a, um, uh, uh, a voicemail and listening to my messages and pulling down what was urgent and then standing there another 20, 30 minutes and calling people from that payphone, having to talk to them before getting in my <laughs> oh, yeah. car and going another hundred kilometers before doing it all over again. Well, wow. to, just to revisit that similar type story, but bringing the telecopter into it, I was on the road with the Sioux Greyhounds and we stopped in a little motel and, and it was one of those motels where they let you in, they give you the room and then there's nobody there. Like they leave, the, there's nobody manning a front desk or anything. And, and so there was no phone to call out on. It was just like a house phone that went to the front. And so you couldn't make a call. And I had, I had a, I had a story written um, that I wrote on the bus on a typewriter um, <laughs> after a Greyhound game. And, and so and now I'm thinking, how am I going to telecopy my story back to the Sioux Star? So I went out to uh, I w- uh, look. There was a payphone out towards the parking lot area, and and fortunately there was close to another building. The payphone was near another building, and there was an electrical outlet on the other wall. I had enough extension cord where I could run the extension cord from the wall into the phone booth, bring in my telecopier, and plug it in. And then get my story and then dial on the payphone, call a collect call to the Sioux Star, and then four minutes a page, and there was probably three pages. So I was like, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes in a freezing cold phone booth while this terrible technology did its thing. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> Unreal. You have to really want it, guys. It seems like, you know, it's it's listening to the two of you talk about it and the way you'd have to, you know, manage your jobs at that point. Talk about wanting it right now. Everything's so immediate. We can get get a hold of each other immediately. Um, when you uh, when you talk about when you talk to people, younger people today, I know both of you get approached all the time by younger people that want to make it in both of your businesses. Are you able to contextualize stories like that, or does it kind of go over people's heads? Well, I think it probably goes over people's heads because everything is. You just assume the world we live in now is the way it's always been. And mm-hmm. it was, and, and it was, you know, there are pros and cons to it. You know, in the old days, when, when your work day was over, your work day was over. They couldn't get you. They couldn't find you on this. And there was no social media and you, you, you couldn't break news 24 seven. I mean, if the team had finished its practice and wasn't playing that day um, and your deadline had passed and your paper was printed already, you could go to the bar or go to bed and feel pretty secure about not being worried about anything. So either you were on and then you were off. And now everything's on all the time. Yeah, exactly. You're on all the time, literally 24 seven. And it seems that, you know, when you have a lot of things going on, there is always a fire uh, amongst somebody somewhere where they need you and they need you now. And it could be at 11 PM. It could be at one o'clock in the morning, but somebody needs you somewhere. So you're always on and, and that can really wear you down over time. Yeah, right. and that's one of the reasons why I was semi-retired when I did. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Bob, uh, you know, you continue on at the hockey news, and the hockey news grows. Um, obviously, like when I was a kid, I was a subscriber for a, a decade or more. I was it was biblical uh, when that showed up in the mail because it was always the biggest piece of uh, mail in the mail. Uh, it was an exciting day. So, so where does you know, where does your story go? Cause you start, you know, last kind of, we left it here, 25 years old, you're just kicking off. Can you talk about the rise of the hockey news uh, and your part in that uh, throughout the eighties? Well, it was, um, I really enjoyed my time at the hockey news. We assembled a really good team and I thought we did a good job um, given the, the, you know, the resources that we had or didn't have. Um, and it was funny because it, we were sort of front row seat to, the changing world that we lived in. So 
in terms of the question I get asked a lot is, so how did you go from being editor-in-chief of the Hockey News to being the Hockey Insider on TSN? And, and the short answer to that question is two, two things basically happened. Um, number one, the Hockey News was looking for ways to up its game you know, because you're a weekly publication and you rely on having to send it out via the mail, hard copy via mail, you, you lose the immediacy. So we had a publisher and, and business people who worked for the Hockey News who were looking for ways to try and monetize and become more current without diminishing the importance of the printed sheet of the Hockey News. So one of the ideas they came up with back in the day was sort of a the 1-800 hotline number. And, you know, if you've ever used to watch, Adam, you're too old, too young for this. Uh, Alan will probably remember this, but, and, and so a lot of people of our age, but like if you watch late night uh, television back in the day, there would be all sorts of really creepy ads for guys to phone, you know, the, these sex chat lines and, and whatever. And they were always like one eight eight, and and you paid like some ridiculous amount of money per minute to, to go and, and, and talk to a woman or whatever. Well, this, the, the, the same sort of, the same principle was at work though, where, where people started to say, well, you know, if people who have interest in this particular subject are willing to pay to use um, the, the telephone, why, why can't we do that? So we actually started a hotline at the Hockey News. It was like a 188 number. And it was basically me. And that, that was the first time that I ever remember being called the Hockey Insider. Um, because the, the hockey news build it as, you know, call up and, and get the, you know, the inside news from hockey insider and our editor in chief, Bob McKenzie. And so people would literally pay like, you know, 30 bucks or 20 bucks or whatever to, to call up and get a three minute or daily rundown on what was going on in the national hockey league. And so I kind of started doing a little bit of that. And we didn't do it every day, but it was like a couple of times a week type thing. And, and so that started to happen. And right around the, the same time, TSN started to do a lot more NHL games and they started doing pregame shows and postgame shows. And, and back in the day, I remember that, like on Monday, I always remember they, they had a game on Monday night and there was usually only one game in the NHL on a Monday night. TSN would have it. And they would start it at like the game would start at 730. And so they would come on the air at seven to do a half hour pregame show. Then they would do the game and games back then used to end in like two and a half hours. So 730 to 10 or like be 10 o'clock, 1005. And they'd have to fill to 11 o'clock for, for the old sports desk before the, the forerunner of sports center. And so because I was doing some of this stuff at the Hockey News and I knew some people at TSN, they called me and they said, hey, do you think you could come in and after the Montreal-Washington game on Monday night and watch some of the game with us and then post-game do a little something in the post-game show? And I said, yeah, sure. So I, I kind of started to dabble at that a little bit. But what the other thing the Hockey News did was they bought a half-hour magazine show on TSN weekly. It was called the Hockey News Television Edition. Jim Van Horn was the host. They produced all the content. But there was a was a two minute segment. Part of the deal was they had to have me on the air for two minutes to do a quote unquote insider segment, huh. and that's kind of where the whole that was around eighty six, eighty seven, somewhere around there, and um, that's basically how it started. That now, is there, there, that's, there was, sorry, that's crazy that that started there like that. I, I, yeah. I never even, you know, you'd never even conceptualize that there'd been a starting point to this thing. It's something that growing up, I was born in 88. So for me, insiders always been a part of the game. So that's crazy. Anyway, oh, Alan, go the, ahead. The, oh, one second, Alan. The, the funny thing is, and I didn't realize this, there's a really good book about ESPN. Um, it's that. Those guys have epic, all the fun. Those guys have all the fun. Yeah. So I, I read that and I, I really enjoyed it. It was great. Um. And I didn't realize it, it when I got to the chapter about Peter Gammons, who was the baseball writer for Boston Globe, and then became the quote unquote ESPN baseball insider. He did that the same year that I started doing stuff on TSN, 
which I, I would have guessed that Peter Gammons had been doing that for like 10 years before I started doing it. But it was basically right around the same time. Um, and I'm by all means not comparing myself to, to Peter Gammons, but it was, I just found it odd that, that that was ESPN started doing the insider thing the same year that in a manner of speaking, TSN started to do it, but probably with a little less sense of purpose. It was mostly because we insisted on it as part of the deal with the hockey news television edition. Wow. But I think you were feeding a need because there was such a hunger for that kind of content amongst the fan base in the, in the NHL that everyone, I think, just started realizing any way we can get information uh, by any means available to the fan is going to be is going to be a winner. There was the, the, the thing that strikes me looking back on it now is that there was no global view of the game of hockey back then in terms of the media you would consume. Like if you lived in Toronto and you followed the Toronto Maple Leafs, then you would read the media in those Toronto papers and they would talk about Toronto Maple Leafs and whoever they were playing that night. But there wasn't a lot of covering the whole league as an entity. And you would on hockey night in Canada, you would back in the day, you would see it. But, you know, even keep in mind as a kid growing up in the sixties, Hockey Night in Canada didn't come on the air until 8.30 on Saturday night. The first right. period was almost over by the time Hockey Night in Canada came on. Look at Adam. It doesn't get really? it. Really? Yeah. <laughs> they didn't run the, go, they didn't run so, the whole game? So, so, no, the game, the game, the game would, the, the game, the puck drop would be at 8 o'clock. Hockey Night in Canada wouldn't come on the air until 8.30. Why? And huh, I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> wow. Because he had to watch Don Messer's Jubilee before. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but in any case, the, the point I was trying to make is that, that there was no global view, in, very little global view of the game of hockey or the league as an entity, as, a, as opposed to a whole bunch of you know, regional and local aspects. And so being at the hockey news, my mind was trained to, okay, it's a 21-team league or whatever it is at any given time. I've got to cover all of that. So my view was always to was very broad in terms of, of that. And so I, I took that to to when I was doing stuff with TSN or or whatever. And 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 as time wore on, you could see that the media became more sophisticated. I mean, I, I tell this story all the time because people ask me a lot about my history with the NHL draft and draft rankings and all that sort of stuff. I think the first draft ranking I ever did at the Hockey News, we ranked like five players, maybe 10. It would have been, I think, 1985, because I, always, I don't know why, but I always remember it was Dana Merzen's draft year. I don't know why I remember Dana more than anybody else, but he just maybe because of his name. But there was, there was zero coverage of the NHL draft in, in any kind of media anywhere. It, was, it just wasn't even spoken of. And when I started to do draft coverage, immediately all the beat reporters for all the other teams would gravitate towards and they, were, they were suddenly like, Oh, wow. You know, we're going to cover the draft now. We've never done that before type thing. And, uh, and, and so everything started to pick up steam really, really fast to the point where it wasn't long, but by 86 or 87, we had a independent publication that separate from the hockey news it was the hockey news, but it was a, a standalone publication for the draft preview. And uh, everything we started to do was uh, the broader concept of covering the league as a league and not just keeping it a narrow focus on a team. Now, I'm sure over the years, you've uh, accumulated uh, an untold number of stories. Many of them have never been told. Maybe a few have been told. But there's one great story about you in the dressing room in Tampa uh, when Phil Esposito was the GM there. Uh, do you want to tell us about that? Well, it was actually Maple Leaf Gardens, and I was working for the Toronto Star. I'd left the Hockey News, and I went to the Toronto Star as a hockey columnist. So it would have been around 92, 90, I think it was 93. And, um, yeah, in, in long story short, I guess I'll get to the I'll, – I'll, I'll go to the bottom line. Um, Phil was mad at something he thought I had written about him. Um, and I had written some stuff that he didn't like, but I, the one thing in particular that incensed him, I, it turned out after the fact that I didn't actually even write it, it was somebody else, but he was the general manager of the Lightning at the time. I was in the dressing room talking to Rob Ramage after the game, 
um, because I wanted to get Basil McRae's phone number from Rob Ramage. Basil McRae badly broke his leg and, and I covered Basil in junior hockey and I just wanted to reach out to him to see if he was okay. And Basil and, and uh, Rob were really, really good friends. So I was talking to Rob Ramage and Phil came in and he basically said, he's, he's screaming at me, get out of here. And I said, no, I'm not getting out of here, Phil. I can be here if I want. And he, um, he kind of drilled me in the, he used the heel of his hand. It wasn't, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a full punch, but it was a pretty good whack with the heel of his hand and hit me on the lower part of my jaw and my neck. And he, he knocked me backwards and I kind of fell back on my hands and, uh, he was coming after me and Rob Ramage and some of the guys jumped on him. And, and I thought momentarily about maybe taking a shot at Phil Esposito and Rob Ramage and the guys were holding him. And then I, you immediately, I, I just, you know, I was doing stuff at TSN at the time, you know, I was doing world juniors and this and that, and, and I had a pretty burgeoning TV career and it's amazing the split second thoughts you have. I thought I could sucker bomb Phil Esposito right now when his hands are being held, but I, I, I can't imagine this is going to play out very well for me. He's Phil Esposito and I'm Bob McKenzie. I don't like my odds on that one. And anyways, long story short, I tried to make up with Phil, tried to settle it with Phil after I came back and, and tried to talk to him. And we kind of got into a verbal exchange in front of a whole bunch of people outside the, the thing. And I said, I, I should charge you with assault. And he says, go ahead. And I said, okay, I will. So I did. And uh, I charged him with assault and uh, it was, you know, and, and the funny thing is, I, as a kid growing up, I love Phil Esposito. I love watching him play and the Team Canada Summit Series in 72. And I, and I actually, and I had no real bone to pick with, with Phil. It was just one of those things that happened. And uh, I was going to let it go, but then he got my Irish up. And uh, <laughs> he, he basically said, he basically said, you're, you're nothing compared to me and you can't do anything to me. And I said, we'll see about that. So I charged him with assault. And uh, it wasn't a fun time because, you know, I kind of got ripped by a lot of people. This is not how hockey people settle things. You don't take things to an outside source. And, and I was thinking, yeah, I tried to do that. It didn't work. So, and anyways, long story short, um, Phil and I straightened it out. We, the day before he was supposed to surrender himself to police, the next time Tampa was in Toronto, he, uh, he uh, he apologized, and I've still got the letter of apology. It was a, it was a begrudging letter of apology. I wrote the letter of apology, <laughs> and Phil just signed it. And he initially looked at it. He goes, "I'm not signing that." And I said, "Good, then we'll go to court tomorrow, and you're probably going to get convicted of assault, and you're going to lose your ability to work in the United States, and so you can play this however you want." But um, I actually like Phil. He's a nice man, and uh, and he's one of my all time heroes. So I'm, I'm glad we got it sorted out. So when, when I was uh, in the agent business, uh, one of the first areas that I started going to on a regular basis was Czech Republic. And at the time that I started recruiting there, there were really only two agents working in the entire country. And every player, when I got there and started meeting people, was either with one agent or the other. And uh, I went in and started recruiting, you know, 16 year old players. And it seemed that Every 17-year-old in the country was signed, but not many 16-year-olds. They sort of had a gentleman's agreement not to start recruiting players until 17. And I went in and I signed a bunch of the top 16-year-olds traveling all over Czech Republic. And, uh, and, and they both got really, really mad at me that uh, a North American, a Canadian and American, you know, a dual citizen was going over to Czech Republic and, and recruiting. So I met the under 18 world championships in Fusen, Germany in April of uh, 1998. And I'm sitting with my wife and it's the big Czech versus Slovakia game. I guess you got to say Czechia, Czechia versus Slovakia game. <laughs> and after the first period, sitting on the aisle, this agent from Czech Republic comes down the stairs and just off of my right side, I see something coming at me and he sucker punches me and he starts and he was kind enough to bring a translator with him who was <laughs> screaming at me in English because this guy was screaming at me in Czech. Don't you ever come back to Czech Republic again? I'm going to have you killed. 
And this guy is saying to me in English, after all that, he's very angry with you as I have a lump growing on the side of my face. He's very angry with you. Don't ever come back. So uh, a bunch of NHL scouts had been and assistant GMs were watching the confrontation and many of them came and separated us and, and pushed them down the stairs to go, go away. And there was Chuck Fletcher was there and Ray Shiro was there and there were a bunch of people. So I start thinking as a former prosecutor, what am I going to do? I'm going to fight the guy in an arena in Fusen, Germany. I went down the stairs. I found uh, an arena manager. I explained to him what happened and he called the police and a bunch of German police officers show up, sit down. And they said to me, is the person who did this still in the arena? And I look out the window and I was like, yep, he's sitting right over there. They're like, OK, do you want to press charges? I said, absolutely. I wrote out a quick complaint. I, I couldn't believe it. The, uh, the officer picked up the phone and called the judge on the phone and read the complaint and got a warrant uh, approved by a judge. And he said, OK, we've got it from here. And during play in the second period, six officers went running up the stairs, moving people out of the way, grabbed this guy, dragged him out to the aisle, jumped on him, put him in cuffs dragged him down the stairs, picked him up. They had opened a door to the back of the arena, ran him out. There was a paddy wagon that was open and threw him in there. And then you hear the siren going. He was actually sitting at the time that the police came for him with a bunch of the Czech parents of the players who were on the ice. And uh, one of the parents was... Uh, the mom and dad of Martin Havlad, who had a big meeting arranged with this agent at the end of the game. Wow. And, uh, and, and Mrs. Havlad told me later, when they saw all this happen, she told her husband, there is no way we're meeting with this person. And there's no way we're going to have this person represent us. And Martin ended up uh, signing with me and, and, and is one of my closest friends. And I represented him for 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 his entire career, wow. so uh, we have we have a, a similar uh, story here about. Uh, <laughs> I, I have to tell you, gentlemen, the, the podcasting business is far less combative. I have not fist fought anyone yet as an adult. So there's I just, still time. There's still time. <laughs> <laughs> so so Bob, you know, you mentioned your move to the Toronto Star there, and that was also like must read if you grew up in Toronto for sports. Uh, you and Damien Cox and a few others there were, you know, every Saturday, Sunday, you're reading, you know, the papers and that sort of thing, especially around the Saturday night games. But, you know, I, I want to ask you about, you know, TSN itself and you jumping on and obviously um, becoming the figure that you are now. And I know that uh, I know that you're an extremely humble person. Uh, so this would be, uh, Not this would that be humble, but. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's one of those where I think, you know, I look at, I look at the, 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 the way the sports grown since about the year 2000. Um, and you were at the forefront of that in terms of, you know, just how much the broadcasting world has changed. Can you talk about what it was like at TSN when you were first there versus say even five years later? Well, as I said, it, it was a gradual process. The, the late eighties, I started doing more and more stuff started building up um, in 1990 or thereabouts I got to do um, color commentary on junior hockey uh, the, the Canadian Hockey League had a package on uh, TSN Paul Romanuk um, was the play-by-play guy uh, Scott Moore who uh, was a broadcast executive at TSN and then Sportsnet and Rogers and uh, uh, now continues to be involved in all sorts of uh, sporting ventures um, Scott and Paul were actually partners. Quite aside from their roles at TSN, they they had a production company and they went to the CHL and got the rights for the CHL weekly CHL games and the Memorial Cup. And then they they bought time on TSN, and so it was their production. So they they uh, wanted me to be the color commentator. And um, funny thing is at the time. Scott worked at TSN, but he wasn't the boss at TSN. 
And there were there were bosses at TSN who didn't want me to be the color commentator. They had somebody else in mind. And uh, I, I always remember Scott and Paul really held firm and said, no, it's our, it's our package and we want him on it. And so I started in 90 doing color commentary on junior hockey games. And that kind of led in 91, TSN did the first world junior, their first world junior. And they made TSN after that first year of me doing junior hockey decided that they would put me on the broadcast. So I started doing world junior on a regular basis, starting in 1991 with TSN. Although I did the 1990 world juniors in Helsinki for the CBC um, while I was still at the hockey news, Don Whitman was the play by play. Scotty Bowman was the color commentator. Brian Williams was the uh, the host and I was the, uh, the intermission analyst. And then after the World Juniors in 91, it was kind of a turning point. I started to do a lot more NHL coverage on TSN. I started to do more, quote unquote, you know, they needed somebody to come on Sports Desk or Sports Center and talk about this trade or this firing or whatever. And there just started to be a gradual, not that gradual, it actually started to happen really fast where I had a full time job at either the Hockey News or the Toronto Star. I started to have what amounted to a full-time job at TSN for basically all of the nineties. Um, some people joke and say, I worked a hundred hours a week. I literally worked a hundred hours a week um, with two full-time jobs and a lot of travel um, because those junior games, like they could be in Seattle. So I'd be leaving Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon to fly to Vancouver to get to Seattle for Saturday night, do the game Sunday night, fly home on a red eye and be in the hockey news office or the Monday morning or the, 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 or pick up my Toronto star duties. And so, and having two little kids at home, it was kind of crazy. My wife, Cindy did an unbelievable yeoman service and holding the whole family together while I was working this 80, 90, hundred hour a week job or two jobs. And uh, in fact, that was my nickname at the hockey news in the late eighties and 1990. It was, they called me two job Bob. So, <laughs> um, but anyways, it, everything just escalated and just had layer upon layer upon layer um, through the entire 90s. And I I could see I was starting to get burnt out I, towards the end. I left the, and one of the reasons I left the star after six or seven years was to go back to the hockey news, but just in a writing position. Um, and because writing once a week, as opposed to writing four columns a week, would have given me more time to do my TSN job. So... Anyways, it all was getting to be a bit much by the late 90s. And I basically told TSN, um, I can't keep doing this. If you guys want me, you're going to have to buy all my time. And if you don't want me, then you're not going to get any of my time. Um, and fortunately, um, they decided to hire me. So it was 2000 when I made the switch and finally gave up a newspaper job. Keith Pelly was the, the president of TSN at the time. And um, it was actually fortuitous because TSN had just lost NHL rights for the first time hmm. to Sportsnet. And, and that was actually one of the motivating factors why Keith Pelly was prepared to pay me for all my time because TSN did not want to lose its position in the market. They felt like they'd forged a pretty good position as with TSN.ca and the amount of hockey they did, junior hockey, world juniors. Um, NHL rights, even though they lost the NHL rights in the late 90s uh, to Sportsnet, that they felt like we got to maintain our position in the marketplace as, you know, the source for all things hockey. And so they invested in, in spending that on me. And, and that's when I went full time to TSN and really became the hockey insider on a full time basis. Now, at the same time, uh, uh, you uh, later on in TSN in your career, uh, started writing books and, and, and you there, I believe there's three that you've authored right now or authored and edited. Um, the first one, uh, was a wonderful book called hockey dad talking about, um, your life, uh, with, uh, two kids playing, uh, minor hockey. And you spoke very eloquently of your son, Sean, who's with Sportsnet right now and an excellent, uh, TV analyst and commentator and a great reporter. guy too. I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> just a great guy. Takes after his mother. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in his own right. And um, Sean suffered from uh, concussions uh, while he played minor hockey. And you talked 
in great deal detail about that. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what it was like from a dad's perspective going through that and seeing your son struggling with with concussion issues off the ice? Yeah, it was it was really, really hard. And it was hard for our whole family. It was hard for Sean. It was hard for my wife, Cindy, myself, um, my other son, Mike, who also had some concussions playing sports. But, um, you know, sh- not, not to belabor the point or go into too much detail, but, you know, Sean had a, a bunch of concussions and not all of them in sports, just, you know, stuff that happened when he was a kid, falling off things in a playground or whatever. Um, but there was, when he got to like minor bantam or whatever, he ended up with a concussion that um, that the, the, the symptoms lingered and he had headaches for a, a good long period of time. And so, as a family, it, it was really difficult. And ultimately, the, the decision was made that Sean couldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't be able to play um, contact sports anymore. And so that was really tough for him because, you know, you're a teenage kid and you love it. You, you play hockey, play AAA hockey in the winter and you play the highest level of competitive lacrosse in the summer. And suddenly you can't do that anymore. So you lose your identity a little bit. Um, and, and on top of that, you don't feel well. Um, because of the symptoms or whatever. So so the happy ending is that Sean's symptoms eventually went away. Um, Sean found his own way. He was able, in a manner of speaking, to go back and still play some play the game at a recreational level and uh, and what have you. Um, but what it did was it, you know, and all this happened, I'm trying to remember the, the years now, but probably uh would have been just uh, after in the early 2000s or whatever, um, or late late 90s, early 2000s, and it, it kind of brought into focus the whole issue of head trauma and and what a what a scurrilous thing it really is for the people who are afflicted by it and how it just creates a whole dark cloud over that person, their family, everything in their environment um, when things aren't right. So. Um, as I said, we we had a very happy ending to ours, but we got a pretty good education along the way of the the dangers and the perils of what concussions do to people. So, mm. do you think the NHL um, over the years has has done enough in, in regard to keeping players safe uh, it, it, with head injuries and and so forth? Department of Player Safety. Well, I would. What I would say is, any question that would be framed like that, I would frame it as the NHL, the NHLPA, the players who play the game, the coaches, the managers, the owners. Uh, you know, and that, all that falls under the umbrella of the NHL. Um, I was a pretty strong advocate in the early. Uh, I, I want to want to go back and say it was around two thousand and five, give or take a couple of years, but that's when. That's when the the head trauma in the NHL and head hits became a really big issue um, because you had the traditional hockey people saying, "Hey, so it's a man's game, and if you if you get hit in the head, that's that's the way it goes." Um, and and because I thought I had a pretty good understanding of what traumatic brain injury is all about, I thought I, I can't reconcile that. So I was advocating at the time any hit to the head is is should be penalized um any significant hit to the head that causes injury should be a suspension and that was a very unpopular opinion at the time because the the traditional hockey values were shake it off you're okay um and if you if you put that rule in place you know hitting in hockey the essential quality of the game of hockey is contact and if you don't have it then the, if you start legislating against worrying about hits to the head, then so so the short answer is no, I didn't think the NHL did enough then. Um, but then I think they started to recognize the, the the perils of it and they started to do you know rule 48 and and, and some other things. but and, and honestly myself, when you, you, you get on a soapbox, and you start to become a little one-dimensional in terms of, you know, penalize these hits to the head and suspend this guy and suspend that guy and and everything. You start to feel a little bit like a one-trick pony, and, and people start to get sick of you, and you you start coming across as a little bit righteous. And so, 
So the, I got a little battle fatigue on that front. And I also started to think, you know what? It's a complicated situation because the guys who play the game themselves, the players, they're not, not very many of them are pushing for change. Not very many of them were pushing for better health and safety. Um, and, and so there was a part of me that said, if the guys that are getting hit in the head don't care about it, why do I care about it so much? And I think the reason, the, the short answer to the question is, that I care about it so much because I have a real good understanding of what repetitive trauma to the, the brain does to people. Right. And I always used to go on, I can remember going on all sorts of radio shows and what have you back in the day and, and telling and, and saying to people, I fear that we are going to be in the, the professional sports, but hockey in particular is going to be in for a world of hurt where entire generations of players are going to be debilitated be, uh, by the, the the trauma that they they suffered, and and as I said, it's uh, it's not an easy thing to deal with because there's a fine line between having you know if you want if you want no concussions in hockey, there's a real simple way to do it: don't play any games because the very nature of the game <laughs> there's boards and there's ice and there's huge men moving at breakneck speed, car accident speed. 30 miles an hour. Um, and even if there's, even if, even if there wasn't fighting, even if there wasn't hits to the head, just collisions and running into the boards or the net or whatever alone, you're going to end up with concussion. You know, I, I, I know parents of kids in girls hockey where minor hockey, where there's, there's not supposed to be any contact and, and the concussions were a huge issue for the girls because they fall and hit their head on the ice or they collide because they're traveling at high rates of speed and that. So I've never felt like there was an easy answer. And, and I've always believed that the NHL should do more. I think the NHLPA should do more. I think, you know, the, the players who play the game should do more. But it's, as I said, it's a real hard one to legislate. And, uh, and I just hope that they, they keep doing everything they can to do it and still keep the game in a position where people are going to want to buy tickets and go see it. And and young kids are going to be allowed to play it uh, because uh, there there has been a trend in certain uh, segments of society of parents not wanting their kids to play once contact is introduced. Yeah, and I, I've had this discussion many times over. I, I and people think I'm nuts, but the later you start contact in minor sports, the better in my mind. I, I think. The good kids who are going to go on to play hockey at higher levels, they they figure it out and adapt how to play the game with contact. And some people say you got to introduce it when the kids are really young. Um, and there's an element of truth to that. You know, this is an example. Um, Sean's age group had they had a pilot program back in the day in Ontario where contact with minor hockey was introduced at the age of ten, and, and Mike's age group it was. And at 12 years old and and when it was introduced at the 10 year old age it was a far more seamless transition because 10 year olds they don't care about hitting mm -hmm. so it was like they would learn it as a skill almost whereas 12 year olds were on the verge of becoming 13 year olds in their their peewee year and that the testosterone puberty's hitting the difference in size between a you know, the, the smallest 12 year old and the biggest 12 year old is probably from what I understand, the biggest gap you can have is right around that 12 or 13 year age thing. And, and when you brought, when, when they brought contact in for Mike's age group, it, it changed the game. It wasn't even Billy Carroll. who used to play for the New York Islanders, Edmonton Oilers. He coached the Ajax Pickering Raiders. I coached Whippy Wildcats. We're good friends. And, and we joked in Pee Wee that year when we would play each other, we shouldn't call it, they, they shouldn't call it hockey. They should just call it hit. Cause that's all the kids wanted to do <laughs> and kids were getting blown up. Like you wouldn't believe and the, and the height and weight discrepancy was just absurd. And, and that, so it, it was seamless, but you know, then they, then you see the studies that say, well, if you do introduce it at 10, you can document here's many more broken bones, many more concussions for 10 year olds. I, even though my, my eye test is telling me that, it's better to introduce contact at 10 than 12. 
when you see the, the statistics that say more kids are getting broken legs, broken arms, separated shoulders, broken collarbones, concussions, you, you can't rationalize having 10 and 11 year olds being hurt more than they would otherwise would be. So you can't do that. Um, so for my way of thinking is I, I don't think the physical part of minor hockey is so absolutely important that everybody's got to run around at 12 years old and, and knock the hell out of each other. And that if you introduce it at 14 or 15, you could still, you could still teach it as a skill, but that's, that's just been my view over the years. Well, I got to tell you just at that 12 year old spot, it was the first time I'd really started playing competitive hockey. We were playing the worst team in the league. And I can remember being a little bit, a little bit cocky defenseman six, two, I'm probably five, four, five, five at this point. I'm like, I'm going to strip the puck off of him. Uh, he's coming out around the boards and he just steamrolled me. <laughs> I remember face down on the ice going, I didn't expect that. And and you, you, it's a, such a huge change within about 12 months, right? Because you all go from about the same size, not really very thick and, you know, muscular. And I remember seeing even somebody like Austin Matthews. I saw him up close when he was 18 and Austin Matthews was enormous. He was huge. And you compare and contrast that with some of the 18-year-olds that come out of junior who are still rail thin, uh, have yet to put on the same muscle mass or not the same size. It, it, you know, it's a very, it's a tough decision to, to call. So, Bob, are you saying 15, 16? Is that when you start or is it 14? or what? Yeah, like, yeah, I'm, I'm like, let's be honest. In minor hockey, you know, the vast majority, like 95%, like, I don't know, it's probably some ridiculously high number. They're not going to play the game beyond... 16 or 17 or 18 years old and, and they're not going to play it at a high level and that so you know are we that desperate that you need to have a system in place that they come out of that where they they've had multiple concussions or the potential for brain trauma um i you know hockey can still be a great game and and I, and I realize it's heresy to a lot of people and the physical part of it's important and and as i said you're still you're not going to you can't legislate concussions or injuries out of a sport like hockey Mm -hmm. because the minute you put boards and ice out there in a contained area and 10, 10 skaters out there moving around at a high rate of speed, there's going to be a lot of injuries, but I just, uh, I just think, you know, the, the, the other, the flip side to the argument that I used to make to people was, um, you know, Chris Nyland, could, could, could he fight? Yeah, he could fight. You know, George Peros, could he fight? Yeah, could he fight? Kevin Westgarth, could he fight? Yeah, he could fight. Well, what, did, what what's in common there? Well, they all played college hockey, and there was no fighting in college hockey. If you fought, you didn't just get kicked out of the game. You could get kicked out for one or two games. Um, and that these guys adapt. So they, they managed to play the college game without fighting, then they went to the National Hockey League and they said, okay, fighting's not only permitted, it's encouraged here and I can make a really good living at it. And so that's what I'm going to do. Um, you know, athletes are very adaptable. And, and, and I think I remember somebody telling me that in Sweden um, at one point, they, they never introduced contact until 15 years old. And I thought, well, you know what? That Peter Forsberg guy, he figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> so it bore you solving. <laughs> um, Bob, one of the things you're doing right now, and thank, thank you for making time on such a busy week for us, is, is no the, the World Juniors. And one of the things Alan and I were talking about before the show is, is the growth of that tournament. And the fact is that, you know, before TSN really jumped on board with this, uh, it was sort of a tournament that, like the draft, people really didn't pay a whole lot of attention to unless you were very close to the game. Um, and it's, it seems to be so fun that even you will come out of retirement to continue to do it over Christmas and spend time away from your family. So I I wanted to talk to you just, I wanted to ask you about where the juniors started to where they are right now. And if you've got any great memories that you'd like to share with that make them so special to you. Wow. I I don't even know where to go with the memories because I can talk about so many things I can remember on the ice. Um, I can remember so many great stories off the ice. And it's it's funny the way the mind works because I can I can think of a whole bunch of quirky quirky stuff um, that has nothing to do with the actual games that that's your memory of it. So I'll tell a, a quick funny story as an example. So it's the 1986 World Juniors. It's in Hamilton. 
the very first World Junior Championship I'd actually physically attended myself. From a hockey perspective, what I remember is in the gold, in uh, there, there was no gold medal game back then. You just played. It was it was the round robin, seven games. Canada's playing Russia, and Cops Coliseum sold out, and it's just roaring. And Jim Sandlack, Alexander Semak, ass over tea kettle into the penalty bench, right into the penalty bench with a big hit, and the entire place erupts, and everybody's like, Rawr! and the roof is coming off Cops Coliseum, and Jim Jimmy Sandlack's a big man, and. So Alexander Simak, who later came to the NHL and his nickname was KGB because everybody thought he worked for the KGB. Um, <laughs> so I can always remember sitting in the press box and I looked down at Simak in the penalty box and his his head, his helmet was turned sideways and his visor was all crushed down. And and he, he was there and he looked around like, oh, OK. And he took his helmet and he fixed it and he hopped over the boards and the puck squirted out and he went down and he grabbed it and scored. He went and he scored a goal. And and it was they uh, it led to the the Russians or the Soviets back then I guess winning the game and I was always I, I don't know why I always remember that but it was just so matter of fact like oh my helmet's on sideways here my visor might be broken but oh there's the puck I'm going to go score and <laughs> and if you if you know the way Alexander Simak played hockey that's kind of he was like really really understated he had like no expression on his face or whatever. It was just like, and, and the, the whole place is roaring. And then the air came right out of the building and the, the Soviets went on to win. But the story I, I wanted to say for Alan, because he would really appreciate one of the people that's involved. So we, I, it was myself, Sherry Basson, um, John Herbert, who was a legendary sports writer for the London Free Press, and Ed Chenouth, the president of the Western Hockey League. And Ed is a, was somebody who was very instrumental in getting Alan started in the business. And I know Alan's very close to, uh, uh, was, was very close to Eddie. Eddie, of course, has passed away. So we're, at, we're in the hospitality suite, which on this particular night became the hostility suite. <laughs> and it was Eddie, Eddie liked, I think he liked scotch and he had a big crystal glass of scotch and Sherry was there. And Sherry loves to talk and tell stories. So, and Eddie's a great storyteller. So you've got Eddie Chanel with a big glass of scotch and you've got Sherry Basson telling great stories. And John Herbert, he, he's this really dialed in junior hockey reporter that he, Wayne Gretzky, the nickname the great Gretzky and the, the guy that I emulated coming up. And Herbie used to wear like a really loud sports jackets like Herb Tarlick in uh, WKRP, you know, big colorful plaids or whatever. And uh, and we were all there talking about something. And, and John Herbert just made a comment about something. And all of a sudden, like the switch went off on Eddie. And and uh, he didn't like what John Herbert had said. And he said, Are you you criticizing my guys? You criticize my guys? And Herbie's like, well, no, I just, you know, I just made my point or whatever. And and Eddie kind of blew up and basically took his glass of scotch and fired it right at John Herbert's head. And Herbie ducked and the glass exploded all over the place and scotch went all over the place. And now Eddie's diving in to grab Herbie and, and he grabs him by the jacket. And me and Sherry are trying to get Eddie peeled off John Herbert. And and anyways, we get him separated and, and Sherry ushers Chanouth out and and Herbie's there and, and his jacket's torn and his hair's all messed up and <laughs> there's scotch everywhere. And, 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 and Herbie goes, and he's like fixing his jacket. He goes, what's with that guy? He goes, a boxing glove in every drink. <laughs> 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 and, hey, and, and so when you say world juniors and I, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's a great world junior story. And I'll, I'll tell one more quick one. I know we'll probably run out of time, but, the um uh uh would have been the ostrava in czech republic i'm sorry in yeah it was the czech republic in ostrava yeah. in 1994 and uh it was a great tournament canada won um but what i always remember is the snake lady story and so it was christmas it was new year's eve and we're staying in the imperial hotel in ostrava and all Teams are staying there. A lot of the NHL scouts are staying there. All the TSN people are staying there. And they've got a New Year's Eve dinner plan. And so I'll try to make this go quickly, but it's hard. Um, so we're all there for dinner. And there's like a cover band doing Eagle songs or whatever. And it's a very nice dinner. Everything's good. And then all of a sudden around 11, 11, 15, 
suddenly a big commotion and in comes like flamenco dancers all dancing around the dance floor and we're like oh that's a little bit of a new year's eve show what the hell and and then they leave and that was five minutes of flamenco dancing and then it was and then a magician came out and he started doing tricks and everybody's like oh this is awesome and then the magician was gone and then out comes a woman and and the, the best way I could explain her, if you've ever seen the show, I Dream of Jeannie, she had on like chiffon robes and the scarves and everything. And she had a big wicker basket was about four or five feet high. And she was dancing around and, 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 and slowly, but surely the, the, some of the chiffon robes are coming off and the scarves are coming off and, and you're like, and so we're all kind of sitting there and someone said, do you think she's stripping? And they're like, no, look at this crowd. It's people, they got their family here. There's NHL scouts, the wives and kids are there. And <laughs> oh, it, couldn't, it couldn't be. And so they were going a little further. And then all of a sudden I said to somebody, I said, she's stripping. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and she was. And, and it, that was enough. So next thing you know, her top is off. The next thing you know, her bottoms are off. And she's a fully naked woman dancing around and there's a whole bunch of people that have headed for the exit, but all the TSN technical people and I were all like, what the hell is going on here? What a happy new year's. And, and so all of a sudden I said, I said to somebody, I said, what's concerning me right now is what's that wicker basket for? <laughs> and, and suddenly I got my answer. They, she knocked it over and she emptied it out. And there was about a six foot live snake. And she, so now she's dancing with the snake and what she did with the snake. I'm just going to leave it to your imagination, but it was, it was otherworldly. And so that was the famous snake lady of Ostrava story. And with, and about 1130 or 1140, like a half hour later the whole thing. So flamenco dancers, magician, snake lady. And all of a sudden she just picks up, throws a robe on, and the whole troop, the whole traveling troop goes rushing out the door. And, and just like that, they were gone. <laughs> and we're like, wow, it's not every day you see that. No. And, <laughs> and so then we went afterwards, we went to another bar and we were in that bar. It was called the People's Disco. And, uh, <laughs> and they were setting off fireworks in there for New Year's Eve. But around 1.30 in the morning, suddenly flamenco dancers showed up on the dance floor at the thing. And I said, they're back. <laughs> and, and the, this traveling troupe was going around Ostrava on shows and the, the, the whole show was going to play itself out again. Flamenco <laughs> dancer, magician, and snake lady at the people's disco. So double that bell. Was the, that was the <laughs> 1994 world junior. So those aren't the kind of world junior stories most people remember, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Bob, one last question here from me, and I'm, I don't want to speak for Alan here, but I want to know, because you deal with everybody, you know, everybody, you've, you've, you got a course, but what's Alan Walsh like as an agent? What's your impression? Well, oh. well, he's a very strong advocate for his uh, clients, and that rubs a lot of people the wrong way, um, whether they're in management or other agents or whomever. Um, but Alan doesn't really care. He just wants to look out for his clients. And if, his, if he's okay with it, if his clients are okay with him, I think that's all he, uh, he really cares about. Cause that, I guess that essentially is the, the job description is he's their representative. And, uh, you know, a lot of Alan's clients, uh, speak glowingly of him and they've been with him for a long, long time. And as he mentions guys like Marty Havlett and David Perron and others, uh, they have a special relationship. Mm -hmm. And have you ever gotten a call from Alan? Oh, yeah. I get calls from all the agents, uh, and they've gotten lots of calls from me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> but, it's, but it's funny. You know, I, one of the things I've always prided myself on is I've gotten along with a lot of agents. And, and it's not unusual for agents to be really mad at me because sometimes you have to report things that put their clients in a, in a bad spot. Um, I can, there's lots of examples where, where I've, I've had stories that I'm breaking or whatever that, that the agent would prefer I don't break, um, simply because it puts one of their clients in an uncomfortable spot. So I can be pals with agents. I can be pals with 
Alan Walsh or Don Meehan or Rick Curran or Pat Brisson or go up and down the list. Uh, I could list them all off because I, I deal with all these agents and I'm friends with a lot of these agents, but friendship can't get in the way of, of me doing my job any more than I would expect whatever level of friendship the agent might have with me would get in their way of representing and taking care of their clients. I, mean, I think that that's, that's the one good thing. I, I always used to joke about agents. That the reason agents and media get along so well is because we're both at the bottom end of the food chain. That, <laughs> when, that, that, you know, coaches and managers and owners and everybody else, the, the, I'm not sure who's lower, whether it's the media or the agents. <laughs> it depends <laughs> on the day, I guess. And what you, what I might have, what, what the media might have written. Or it's whatever, a fight to but, the bottom. <laughs> but you know we we have uh you know we have a lot in common on a lot of uh, modifications yeah i i've got one more question bob can you tell us a little bit about how bobby margarita came to fruition well uh, five years ago i jokingly on um, just for fun on social media when i went on vacation after free agent frenzy i i posted a picture a video of me mixing margaritas in a frozen concoction maker and i changed my twitter handle from bob mckenzie to bobby margarita and it kind of took off and uh, people kind of got a kick out of it and without even trying to like even after that like some people would say hey bobby margarita they'd see me or uh, I'd, I'd i'd break news on twitter or whatever and somebody would say oh big news from bobby margarita and i was like it's not funny i just did that one thing in the summer and now people are calling me that so people signed, kind of leaned into it. And then quite frankly, once vacation time came, I created this fun persona where I leaned into it. So that was basically as far as it went. Um, but a lot of people did sort of, you know, a couple of years ago, if I posted something, 30%, 40% of the replies would be referencing Bobby Margarita for no other reason than that's how people sort of referred to me. So anyways, long story short, my son, Sean, and I talked before, hey, wouldn't it be cool to have a drink called Bobby Margarita? Yeah, too bad a tequila company hasn't come to us with an idea. And then Sean said, yeah, but he says, we should even sell merchandise. Maybe we would sell hats or t-shirts, Bobby Margarita hats and t-shirts. I said, yeah, it sounds like a good idea, but probably sounds like too much trouble. I don't think so. So last March, he got a call from a guy by the name of Brock James, who used to be a Molson rep in London when Sean went to school there. Now he works for the Ace Beverage Company, which has Cottage Springs, Ace Hill, and really big and ready to drink cocktails in Ontario and across Canada. And uh, he was wanted to send some beer to Sean, um, some Ace Hill beer. And so Sean said, yeah, give me a call. So he called him, and they hadn't spoken in more than 10 years. It was just serendipity, and, and the guy wanted to promote his new beer. And, uh, and Sean said, hey, Bobby Margarita, why not? And the guy goes, ooh, that's might be a good idea. Let, let me talk about it with our guys at Ace. And like an hour later, he came back and said, you want to do something? Let's, let's see if we can do it. And that was March. And then we just, it was like a rocket ride after that. We started working on can design, logos, um, formulating the liquid, doing tasting panels, um, all that stuff. And we got approval to get in the LCBO in Ontario for April of 2022. And and we got decided to launch here in Alberta this month in December. We're in Nova Scotia now. We're going to be in Saskatchewan, Prince Edward Island, and uh, in Ontario in April. And it's been a lot of fun. I'm now adding Booze Mogul to my titles. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. The uh, the video you released, the promo video in conjunction with the, the <laughs> launch, me. was was just unbelievable. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, that well one, done. I, I don't want to give too much credit to my son, Sean, because it goes to his head, but that was his idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been so much fun. The rollout's been fun. And it's, it's, you know what? I think Bob, uh, the, the, I think the, the crux of it is it's good to see good people win. And so I'm excited for when it comes to, uh, the LCBO here in April. Uh, like you said, it's out Al Alberta and it's at the NSLC in Nova Scotia as well. Yes. Alberta and Nova Scotia right now and, uh, Saskatchewan PEI and Ontario in April. And hopefully we'll add other provinces. We get all sorts of people. Hey, what about BC? Just then go, go to the BC liquor commission, tell them Bobby Margarita wants in. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll Any word on the United whenever. States? 
No, I don't think uh, it, it, there's a lot of complications immediately talking about the U.S. So we're going to try and conquer Canada first, and then we'll uh, we'll go from there. Got it. <laughs> All right. Well, Bob, listen, you've been extremely generous with your time uh, uh, going over time, and uh, we really appreciate it. It's been an amazing conversation. And uh, enjoy the rest of the World Juniors in Edmonton. Stay stay warm. And uh, let's hope everything goes well and we can get down to a gold medal game without any more uh, delays or complications. Okay. Thanks a lot, Alan. Thanks, Adam. Really appreciate you guys having me on. Thank you, Bob. Got it. Thanks, Bob.